The time is 5.30 p.m. on Monday, April 24th, and I'd like to call this work session to order. First on our agenda are our lobbyist updates. So I see Ryan. Good evening. Um, I'm going to be filling in for Gil tonight. He had a he had a health emergency, so I'll be doing our I'll be doing our update and uh, I'll try to answer any questions. But if there's anything I can't answer, uh, we will follow up uh, as soon as possible. If that's OK with with the council. Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. OK, thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Ryan Romero representing Capital Success Group. The first item that we wanted to talk about tonight is HB 12, 231294, Pollution Protection Measures. This is the bill that we we took an opposed position a couple of weeks ago. The bill was heard in committee on last Thursday. Testimony lasted about eight hours. Mayor Gratisar and David Ferriman of Evraz both gave excellent testimony in opposition to the bill. The bill was amended in that almost all of the original bill was struck. And in this case, it was changed into a study. An interim committee will be directed, directed to study and provide feasible options to, to improve air quality. It was passed out of committee and will be heard in House Appropriations Committee tomorrow morning before it goes to the House floor for second reading. Evraz is still opposed. And quickly, we just wanted to say thank you to the mayor and to Mr. Ferryman taking the trip up and giving their testimony to the committee. It really makes a difference when these legislators can hear from the experts that are directly impacted. The committee heard over eight hours of testimony and at the end of the night, in the, in the bill sponsor's closing remarks, she specifically called out Pueblo and stated how grateful she was to hear from the Pueblo delegation and how impressed she was with Evrez and its commitment to using clean energy sources. Next up is Senate Bill 23-213, land use. The bill was passed out of committee last week with amendments that changed the bill significantly. These amendments limit the preemptions such that cities would only need to allow multiplexes and middle housing options on 30% of the land currently zoned for single family homes, with an emphasis on prioritizing transit corridors. Municipalities without transit oriented communities and key corridors must still zone for a minimum area of multifamily housing and middle housing. The ADU component remains, however, an amendment does specify what size these units can be, limit, limiting them to no larger than 800 square feet and no smaller than 500 square feet. The bill uh, 213 was supposed to be heard in Senate Appropriations Committee on Friday, but was delayed. It was then rescheduled to be heard in committee this morning, but at the sponsor's request, it was laid over again. Uh, to explain this dynamic further, there are seven committee members that sit on appropriations, four Democrats and three Republicans. In this case, Senator Zenzinger, a Democrat from Arvada, represents the swing vote, along with Senator Kirkmeyer, who also sits on the committee. Uh, Senator Zenzinger released an op-ed in the Colorado Sun yesterday in which they voiced voice their strong opposition to the bill. They want to see the bill amended to remove all state control of land use planning and to leverage state resources to help local governments achieve these housing goals. We will keep following these two bills clo closely and keep you updated on any new new developments and continue to track all of the legislation on our bill tracker. And that concludes my prepared remarks and I'd be happy to try to take any questions. Great, thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> what uh, questions are there from council? Seeing none, I did have kind of a similar, I, it's not necessarily with the state legislator, but um, as we all know, uh, UC Health and Parkview are getting merged right now, or UC, Mer UC Health is gonna kind of take over Parkview as the new kind of head um, overseer of Parkview. And I know that um, Attorney General Phil Weiser's office is overseeing that merger. Um, and I know that uh, Attorney General Weiser has had several listening sessions 
but um, I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for us as a council or through you as the lobbyist to really advocate um, to for specifically for youth mental health treatment as, as they're doing this merging process. I think that um, Attorney General Phil Weiser is wanting to hear what needs there are in our community, and I would appreciate us either writing a letter or having our lobbyists really uh, talk to him and lobby to have more mental health supports in this new hospital specifically for mental for youth because that's they shut down their whole floor with uh, for um, treatment and um, it's a huge it's a huge need so. Um, I don't know if council would be amenable to that, but that's what I would like. Um, Pueblo City Schools did did write a letter from their Board of Education uh, to Attorney General Phil Weiser, and I, I'd like for our lobbyists to talk to him about that. Council, okay, so yes, 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 yes. Excellent. So Ryan, I don't, I, is that something that you would be open to doing? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think a letter is a great place to start, and then um, I'll, I'll get this information to Gil. But I think that we can definitely start talking to Phil Weiser's office and the people around him. Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Councilman Flores. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have much information on this, but there was a uh, editorial in Sunday's paper by Senator Heinrichsen uh, sponsoring a food desert. Uh, bill and um, I, I don't we haven't talked about this at all but um, I was wondering if you could take a look at that and give us this uh, specifics at our next meeting um, about where that's at um, unless you know the answer now or what what the what the bill is actually going to accomplish <clears throat> uh, councilman Flores this is a, it's a bill sponsored by Senator Henry Heinrichsen, you're asking about. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your question. Um, are, are, are you asking about in the article? Does it does, is he talking about a bill that he's he's sponsoring? Yes. Okay. I let me. I think we'll we'll have a conversation with Senator Hen Henriksen, and we can bring you some more. Um, Detailed. Yeah. I was trying to find the uh, the bill number, but I, I I don't have it with me. And the other thing I can do is I can go ahead and uh, send that article to you. Okay. All right. That'd be great. We can we can look that up, but we will we will have a conversation with Senator Henriksen as well and talk. All right. About that would be a good idea. Thanks a lot. No problem. Councilor Tentio. Yeah, Ryan. I'm on the uh, Colorado Municipal League board. I got an email from CML uh, and the carve outs and new requirements do not change CML opposition to 213. And we should let our uh, representatives know that municipalities will continue to oppose the bill until preemptions, mandates and states centralization of local land use authority are out of the bill. Those are the uh, one, two, three things that are most important to other municipalities and CML and should also be our central opposition points also. So okay. we will, uh, yeah. when, you, when you talk to our, uh, our representatives and other representatives up there, especially the Senate, since it's going to the Senate now, uh, let them know that those are exact, the exact things that we're opposed to. Yes, sir. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. Other questions for Ryan? Seeing none, thanks Ryan, and please give our, our best to Gil. Okay, I will, thank you guys. Um, great, moving right out along on our agenda, our city updates, so Ms. Solano, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and City Council. Um, I do have um, a few updates this evening, and uh, to start out with, I do not have a COVID update. The numbers didn't come across my desk, so for the first time in a long time, there's not a COVID update. 
I'll move on to ARPA. Uh, to tonight's agenda, we'll see on first reading uh, $200,000 of ARPA funds for the Lights On for Safety grant. It is an ARPA matched for Crime Stoppers that will match the Black Hills Energy $200,000 uh, donation to Crime Stoppers. On second reading is $750,000 ARPA um, award to Crossroads Turning Point. And on second reading is $40,000 to Pueblo Cooperative Care Center for the Mobile Showers for um, Homeless. Upcoming ARPA this evening is discussion on update of the Million Dollar Trash Program and how that is going. And um, we also have next actions that um, we will um, look forward to this week um, on a Crazy Faith Ministries request. I sent out the, um, the memo from the law department last week. So anybody with questions or updates or concerns or direction, would you just send that back electronically to me and I'll take it forward to um, Mr. Jagger and to the mayor. And also on 5-8, there will be a new request for uh, the use of ARPA revenue, uh, lost revenue replacement uh, for the purchase of a skid steer and a trailer for code enforcement. It's coming up, of course, on code enforcement's busy time if there's a more busy time than another. But if for them to have their own piece of equipment that will help them in, in pick up and for more safety, um, it'll be a request um, to use ARPA funds lost revenue for that skid steer for code enforcement. And then moving away from um, ARPA, another reminder to the community that the Team Up to Clean Up Community Trash Dump Day is coming up soon, Saturday, May the 2nd. It will be at the Colorado State Fairgrounds. There will be no cost to the public. The press release went out today. The social media campaign went out today. Uh, the public chieftain will advertise both online and in print with at least three times between today and the sixth. And it will include the listing of what is approved and suggested to um, bring for dumping and then what, it, what they cannot accept. And then a new um, information and press release went out today. The municipal court is participating in a warrant forgiveness program with the 10th Judicial District Attorney's Office, the Colorado State Public Defender's Office, Pueblo County Sheriff's Office, the 10th Judicial uh, Probation Department, Recovery Monetary Services, and the Pueblo PD. This is going to occur on Saturday, May the 20th of 2023. And Judge Sykes says the purpose is to allow people to get back on track and resolve any outstanding municipal cases. Individuals with a warrant are invited to municipal court at 200 South Main Street in Pueblo from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And individuals will have an opportunity to speak to a defense attorney. Uh, the press release did go out today, social media campaign later in the week, so we can get the word out um, to the citizens with all those entities participating. There's also a telephone number, and next week we'll, we'll put it up on the screen as it gets out. But for more questions or for additional information, um, uh, the phone number at Municipal Court to call is 719-562-3850. And that um, does conclude the city updates for this evening. Do you have directions or questions for me? Any questions from council? Councilor Graham. Uh, Ms. Solano, I just have a few things. Um, number one, the meeting with cooperative care. Um, can we get that scheduled that I have been asking for for a few weeks? With PD and about the homeless, a small President, meeting. President Graham. A uh, continuum of care. Continuum of care. But yes, of care. we can yes. get that scheduled. And there is a continuum of care meeting tomorrow that I plan to at 10 o'clock at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I will see if I can get an agreement on a date then. Okay, great. And then the next thing is um, I was contacted by the Urban Renewal Authority and moving forward with the Colorado Smelter Urban Renewal Area. Um, they would like to come before council. Um, so I'd like to instruct that we set a hearing with Urban Renewal for May 8th. Thank you, President Graham. I'll pass that on to also planning department who okay. is a regular communicator Great. with them. And then the third thing, I think this is for you, Mr. Jagger. Um, there was some questions on changing public forum and if that needed to be a consensus at work session or if that needs to be in a resolution agenda item and how you want to see that yeah. come across. How I advise is that since this has been an established practice of the council, that's my understanding. I'd recommend that it be put on the agenda under council policy matters, and then you could address it as a motion, uh, and then the council could do it. And the motion, I, the context is, I, I think, is you want to change uh, the people are allowed to speak at public forum, 
from whoever gets here first to everybody signs up, then we kind of do a quick lottery and pick them. Uh, so if you want to proceed that way, I think that would be appropriate and we'd put it on council policy matters. Okay. And is that something you need to draft or? Uh, a, you could do it by oral motion. I could do a written motion. Uh, does it need to be, it's not something we can do tonight though, I guess is my, can it be done just a work session with a consensus? No, it, you'd want to put it on the agenda. Okay. Can so we be at a regular meeting? If you want to put it on tonight's agenda, you'll need to amend the agenda to add the item under council policy matters. Okay. And, and uh, you could do an oral. The only thing I, I think you want to clarify is uh, how is staff going to do it? Because right. apparently they're going to just have all the names and have to do a quick lottery. Yeah. So what I was thinking is there's been some disruptiveness when people are coming to sign up um, in the back and um, people getting here first and lining up. And so to allow everybody to have the same chance to speak, um, they could sign up. We'll take as many names and then the clerk would pull, you know, six, six names. And those would be the six people that we hear from because I know a lot of people don't get off work, can't get here right before six o'clock to get their name. And I just think it would be a more equal way to get the entire community to be involved in speaking if if that's something the council wants to see happen. Mm -hmm. If uh, time is uh, one of the constraints, should we move to 630 instead of six o'clock like the sign up time? Would that help? Also, in addition to well, they, what you're wanting to Well, do. we had said that maybe people could sign up all the way up until seven o'clock. That sounds And good. then right before the meeting, um, the store would select the six, pull six names, and then they would know right away whether they should hang around if they want to speak or not. Just in okay. fairness, I, I know I'm sure you guys get emails about how do you come speak to council and you say come to public forum and they get here and there's already six people signed up. So you you see them leave and then the next day they say, well, you said come to public forum and speak. And so I just think this would be a fair way to let everybody have a chance to speak. Mm -hmm. Other question, Ms. Lano. And, and Madam President, could we include there how to include those that would like to speak on Zoom? Yeah. So I guess I'm hearing uh, Councilor Tentio. Oh, oh. I, I don't know what your intent is. Is, is your intent to it's to keep the regulars? It's to from, allow more than the first six people that get in line to speak without extending the time. Like, you know how sometimes I extend it. Turn your, turn, oh. It's to allow people who are still at work and aren't getting off at five o'clock to not, when they get here, there's already six people in line, so they can't sign up. So you know how sometimes I let people stay to talk. It's just giving everybody a fair chance up until seven o'clock to be able to speak. I guess I still don't know what it means. Okay. Let me take a stab at this. Uh, we normally have the same people speak because they know the process now right. and they get here and they uh, basically monopolize right. the first six slots. Yeah. Your way, which I like, is uh, you know uh, giving everybody the same opportunity, opportunity and same that. chance. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's probably a process. That doesn't mean that the regulars aren't going to, be, no, the, their names is, yeah. could possibly be picked. Well, they will. Some of them will, but it's just to give a better chance for everybody to be able to sign up. What, so, what's yeah. the criteria you're going to use to pick who's going to speak? I think we were just going to use numbers. So they would sign up. There's numbers on here. And then just the number that they are, we would just be able to reuse the same numbers Wait. over and over again that you've one, two, hat. four, six. Just, no, pick, pick eight, from a hat 10, kind of thing. 12. And maybe the 10 minutes um, intervening between the end of work session and the beginning of the city council meetings. Um, maybe I just come up here and pull the first six numbers would be an option. Okay. I'm open to suggestions. That's all I have. Great. So it, it um, I, I like the ideas as well. I think it's a more equitable are, you know, to give everyone an opportunity. Um, so what I'm hearing then is we'll have to make a, an amend a motion and then just do a verbal vote at the regular meeting. So you'll have to make a motion to amend the agenda to include a new item on council policy matters regarding open uh, process for 
uh, speaking at the public forum. And then when that item comes up, you could make a motion. Uh, it'll be an oral motion because obviously not enough time to write it up. And however that oral motion is presented, then you'd vote on it. Okay, then seeing uh, Councilor Tencio. Yeah, I have one more thing. Uh, Laura, uh, at our retreat, uh, Council asked that we ask Urban Renewal to do a study on the Troy Avenue Urban Renewal Project area that we were looking at. Uh, does that take a resolution of some sort to ask them to do that? Councilor Atencio, when we, we, when we talked on the phone about this, I forwarded the email and I, I'm, I'm not heard anything back. So I'll, I'll confer with Scott. He was out last week um, to see if the standard practice is, is um, just to invite them with a request, an email request, or does it, it take an ordinance to or city council to support that? I don't think so. I think it takes a resolution. A resolution. Asking them to do a, a project study. Mm -hmm. to, see, yeah, to see if it's blighted, to see if it fits the uh, criteria to do one. And if we see Mr. Hopkins this evening, we'll, we'll bring it back up uh, in okay. one of his um, staff reports. Thank you. Great. Seeing no other city updates then or questions, moving on our agenda. Next, we have an inform informative presentation about pallet shelters. I see Ms. Rugg is zooming in. So um, whenever you're ready, Ms. Rugg. Great, thanks so much for having me. I'll go ahead and, and share my screen and jump right in to the presentation. It looks like I need to be enabled to share my screen. Oh, they're doing it for me, wonderful. Okay. It looks like we're working on it. All right, here we are. Perfect. So I work for Pallet, and we are the national leader in responding to um, homelessness with rapid response shelter villages. So tonight I'll be going over more about who we are, talk about our, our concept and our, our model, as well as our products that we manufacture, and then highlight some case studies for you all. So Pallet, we very much pride ourselves in being um, responding to homelessness for the emergency that it is, which means we work with rapid timelines. These shelter villages that you see right here, we can um, put, we, we can assemble one of these sleeping cabins in an hour, and we can we can assemble a whole village in a week. We can fit on a semi truck fifteen of these shipping of these sleeping cabins and ship them out to the project site. We've established one hundred of these across the country, and we've worked with eighty five different municipalities in the process. And all of them are managed by third party service providers such as Salvation Army, a Rescue Mission, Catholic Charities, to give some names. We are a fair chance employer, which means that sixty five percent of our company has lived experience with these exact issues that are often facing people in homelessness, whether it's street homelessness, substance abuse disorder, or criminal justice system reentry after spending time in incarceration. Because we believe that those who have lived experience, they have the ins an insider's knowledge, and this is the game changer for addressing this crisis. Because their voices make the difference when you're trying to uh, create an option that people will accept who are currently homeless, and two, that they'll stay in long enough to stabilize and, and transition on to permanent housing and to meet, um, make progress on their goals. So we are a pathway towards permanent housing because the reality is, is that permanent housing takes a long time to build. Pueblo is probably five or 10 years out from having enough housing stock to meet the demand. And you can't just have um, tents and encampments along riverbeds and in parks in the meantime, there needs to be a better option um, that bridges the gap that people will, ac will accept and they'll, that will make progress in their goals towards. So that's where Pallet comes into play. So we are a non-congregant option. We, which means that we're a little bit different than, than the traditional approach. Oftentimes a shelter looks like one big room with a lot of bunk beds inside where people check in that day, bring all their belongings with them. They sleep there that night. They check out the next day, bring all their, take all their belongings with them again. And it becomes this revolving door. It's, it's great for you know, emergency situations 
um, when there's a really a quick cold night, but it's not great for actually helping people exit the cycle of homelessness because it doesn't meet that stability of place. You can't go to a job with all your belongings with you without an address to, to um, put on your application. You need a, a place where you can leave your belongings, you can lock the door and go for an interview or whatever it may be. And so that's why we create this approach, this non congruent style, which looks like our sleeping cabins are like private bedrooms. These are private quarters for people to stay um, during their time. And it's a private residential community and there's an intake process, right? And that's your, when you are admitted to the program, that's your bedroom for your duration of stay. And then you're, you have the accountability of on-site staff and then uh, collective, immunity, uh, collective amenities to help you in your time there. And so Pallet, we don't just set up villages and walk away. We're very much invested in creating a healthy um, healing environment, all the villages. And what we found is that when these five dignity standards are in play, supportive services, hygiene needs, transportation needs, and safety and access to food and, and water, when you have plans in place that meet all five of these, you have the right recipe to create a healthy environment. And across all of our villages, the ways that our customers and service providers meet these needs, it varies according to your resources, according to what makes sense. And we can help advise in that process as you create your project. So Pallet, we have presence and communities in 21 different states. This is not a pilot program that I'm presenting to you all. This is a proven method and we've replicated it over and over and seen such great success. Some impacts to share about are one that people are transitioning on and exiting homelessness and moving into permanent housing. And two, that we're seeing results where police and ambulance calls that are related to homelessness are reducing in areas where there are pallet villages set up. And then also we're seeing that those that there's referrals and active inroads being made for, for people to generate income and to, to, to end um, unemployment. And then lastly, point in time counts are going down. So you're creating, again, this pathway out of homelessness, which is um, helping people transition onto permanent housing. And that is helping people exit homelessness faster than people are entering into homelessness, which is the goal, right, to end this, this crisis. So kind of moving into our units that we manufacture. Our, our structures are materials that are rot, pet, and and mildew resistant, which means that they can be easily cleaned and wiped down. So in your village, right, um, people move in and they stay there. And then once they reach their, their goals, they, be, they can be reunited with family, they move on to permanent housing, whatever it may be, then you can the staff can easily clean the, the units and then move someone off the wait list. All of our villages right now have wait lists because that it's such a high demand. And um, the other key thing about our products to know is that um, they are, uh, they're easily, they're very durable, right? So they, they, we, our design bears in mind that there's a lot of wear and tear that, 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 um, the units may see from this, this residential population. So we, we've made it so that, um, it's panelized, right? So if say something happens to one of the walls, it's not like it's sheetrock where you have this lengthy process to repair it. You can easily, we can just ship out a new panel to you and then you can replace that wall immediately. Our most popular product that we manufacture is our shelter 64. It's 64 square feet. And it is um, it can accommodate two beds for you know typically it's a you know a parent and child or it's a couple that wants to stay together, but most common the shelter sixty four is single occupancy. And inside there's um, there's climate control options uh, as well as um, you know these these beds that fold up into the wall. You can store things underneath. And then there's fire safety features: fire extinguisher, smoke detector, carbon monoxide monitor, and a fire egress door. And you need, you need to connect these units up to 120 volt, 20 amp dedicated electrical service to power the climate control, the lighting. We also have a, a larger sleeping cabin, which is 100 square feet. And this is often purposed for a double occupancy unit for strangers because it has that six feet of distance between the beds. And uh, similarly, right to the, the structure I showed you before, there's the fire safety features, the storage underneath the beds. Um, these also have been purposed for families. So you, we can uh, add an, an additional set of bunks. So there's bunk beds on either side to get four beds in that unit to accommodate a family. 
Another option that we do offer is fold down desks. So this cabin can also be purposed for an office unit. So you, you can imagine the bunks aren't there and instead there's desks. So that can be used for case management um, to build um, relationships between the residents and the staff. We have hygiene units as well. This is our standard stall. There's a shower sink and toilet in each. These need to be connected up to water, sewer, and electrical. We have accessible bathroom units. There's a grab bar, walk-in seat, a shower, floor drain, and then there's a secondary half bath that's used, typically used for admin purposes. We have laundry room units. These can accommodate four sets of washers and dryers. There's a utility sink and a table that you can use for folding clothes. We have community rooms, and these are two different sizes based off the size of the village. So 400 square feet, 800 square feet, and these are often purpose for dining. So uh, customers will bring in refrigerators and microwaves and tables. Um, we've also seen these be used for programming space, indoor warming places. Um, so for AA meetings or after school programming, if it's a family focused village. In terms of what needs to be in play for these villages to be, to be set up, it's very straightforward, it's very simple. We just need relatively flat ground. So most of our villages are repurposed parking lots or they are a, a piece of property that's gonna be developed later on. But for right now, you're in the whole process of, of entitlement and the architects design the, the, the site plans, which you know can take three years. So in the interim, put it for towards an emergency need, which is emergency housing like this. So um, what it, that, the, the setup looks like is uh, we need a, a level plane to put to place the units on top. So that's what those images show there in the top right corner. Um, oftentimes, you know, a city's public works team will put these together. They're very simple two by what, four wooden frames. They shim it to level, and then our team comes out, assembles the sleeping cabins, and places them on top. The other things that need to need to happen before a village is ready for people to move in is to um, to add in the the utilities. So in terms of electrical, right, the most common thing we see is overhead striking of wires or laying conduit along the ground. So it minimizes any type of trenching, which, um, you know, if, especially if you have a parking lot or a, a piece of land that's going to be used for later on, you want to minimize the impact to the ground in that way. And then another step, right, is anchoring the units to meet wind requirements. It's kind of like a tent. Uh, so that photo there in the top right corner shows that there's a pullout rod in all of our structures. And then you would select the right anchoring um, mechanism for the ground surface that you have. And we have a lot of different examples of what past customers have used, and that helps it meet those wind requirements. The last thing is adding in ramps for the accessible um, units. Uh, HUD requires that 5% of dwelling units are accessible in a program. And so here's an example of how other customers have done that. All of our units in their interior layout can accommodate the 60 inch wheelchair radius. It's just that there's a lip at the threshold that needs to be um, compensated for with the ramp. So jumping in to some examples of where this is happening. So Sonoma County, I'd like to offer up this example of a, of a rapid response approach to an encampment that was alongside a riverbed that um, had become hazardous, uh, both environmentally, also for public safety. And so the county reached out to us saying, hey, like we need to do a, uh, we need to close down this encampment and we need an alternative that people will accept. Will you work with us? We're like, absolutely. 10 days later, we set up in a county owned parking lot, 60 of our sleeping cabins. And immediately there was a wait list. It was that popular for people to, to move from where they were into the shelter. And this is managed by uh, St. Vincent de Paul, um, that service provider. And it's been up now for about three years and it's continually been helping people move on to permanent housing and exit street homelessness. I like to highlight LA as an example of how we've worked with a city where you have very odd shaped parcels, the land is scarce, and we've worked, um, we've set up uh, villages and, and transit land as well as in residential communities where they put up nice privacy fencing so it blends into the streetscape. And what we found is that, you know, th there was, of course, some resistance at the beginning because people were afraid. What does this mean? You know, you're bringing in a homeless shelter into our, into our backyard. And what we found is that those, those, Critics in the beginning ended up after the project pushed forward, became ch project champions. And there were community days where people would come in and they would paint the units. They would, you know, people are donating and because they see how much impact it's having. People are getting off the streets. Parks are being resumed to their original purposes. Um, 
now moving on to another example of Boston. This is a creative uh, example of partnering with a, a hospital. This is set up in the parking lot there, and there's actually nurses that do rounds there because this village is focused on um, recuperative care and also helping people detox from, from addiction. And then Aurora, which is a, an example that's closer to home. Um, this they Aurora first started off with a managed camp situation where they had Eskimo tents. But then after about a year, they saw they had to replace their tents because of all the wear and tear that they were seeing. And so they called us and said, you know, what can we do that's more durable? And then we replaced those tents with pallet structures. Our structures have a 10 year lifespan, two year manufacturer warranty. And it's been so successful and well-received, they've opened up a whole new site. So now there's two sites and there's 106 beds that are existing in Aurora, um, helping address homelessness there. And then lastly, what I'll end with is Burlington, Vermont. Um, this is a, a village that showcases our, um, our winterized units that we launched last um, December that are thicker, thicker insulated and um, that are more energy efficient which is what I would recommend for, for Pueblo's uh, climates. And then they used ARPA funds um, as well as some private dollars um, from one of their community foundations to help stand up this village. So that brings me to the end of my presentation and I would love to help field questions that you have. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Rugg for that presentation. What questions are there from council? Councilor Graham. Thank you, Ms. Rugg, for coming to present. Ms. Rugg and I miss, met um, when Councilor Martinez and I went to Washington, D.C. for the National League of Cities, and I thought that this would be a great way to use some of our remaining ARPA funds. So can you talk a little bit about the average cost um, and then also the positivity rate of cleaning up the homeless issue in other cities? Absolutely. So our single occupancy with a thicker insulation, which would be best for your climate, that um, is, a, is around 13 grand per unit. That's with us assembling it and tax and shipping, right? So um, if you are you know, creating a village that's serving 50 people, you're looking at roughly $770,000 uh, for all those sleeping cabins shipped out to you and assembled in Pueblo. In terms of some, some great impact that we're seeing, right, on the positivity piece is that uh, it's um, first is being really well received by those who are experiencing homelessness. They, and we, we aren't surprised because it's all been designed with the lived experience um, speaking to what would be effective. Uh, and then another thing that's we're seeing is uh, again, that the crime is going down in the surrounding areas. Um, there's less res reliance on, on police and on ambulances to, to respond to homelessness, which as we know, that's really expensive. And two, they aren't, you know, they aren't the best trained. It's, it's, it would be really great to have more of, you know, social workers, right, being the ones that are caring for those that are experiencing homelessness, which is exactly what our model does, right? There's these private residential communities that are managed by service providers who know how to engage that population. Councilor Flores? Uh, you didn't mention uh, the operating costs going forward. Uh, um, what would what, what is the average operating cost for one of your units? So Pallet, we don't provide the operation side. That's something that the city typically they will put on RFP or they'll contract with a local provider that they have a relationship with, that they will manage the site. And that varies in terms of what they charge. Um, so, you know, just in terms of ranges, what we've seen is it can be $60, $69 uh, per unit a day um, for, for services and operations. And you, you know, multiply that out, right? Um, and, you know, up to, you know, $120 per, per unit per day. So uh, it, it, it really depends on what your local service provider charges. Yeah, I guess I was more focused on, you know, utility costs, electricity. Uh, uh, we're going to have costs uh, dealing with trash removal, with uh, right. uh, water, just the typical stuff that you sure, need to sure. cooperate. Uh, yeah, uh, so, in, so Burlington, Vermont, that last uh, mm -hmm. case that I showed you, um, their operations, their uh, they're budgeting around a, a million per year with with uh, the service provision as well as you know electrical and um, the, the as you were mentioning the trash removal. Thank you. Other questions, Councilor Meister. Uh, that million per year. How many units was in that uh, particular um, 
setup that you have for a million year to operate? 25. How many? How many? 25 units and the Burlington, Vermont. Oh, 25 units. Mm -hmm. And um, so the $770,000 to set up 50 units, that doesn't include like land acquisition, um, bringing the utilities into the, um, uh, the, sub, um, the subdivision and none of the civil part of it, correct? Like to prepare the land and everything for the setup? That's right, yes. Okay. And again, it, it really varies. I can give you um, in terms of what the overall site development cost would be based off of, you know, is there is it is, is there sewer that's right there and vice versa. But a, a example I can offer, um, bearing in mind that there's a lot of variables here, is that uh, we're setting up a village that's opening up next week um, or two weeks from now in May uh, in Chula Vista. And it's going to be serving 60 people. And its total cost all in after everything was um, included is about 4 million, um, a little over 4 million. Okay. Um, how many units did you set up in Sonoma? 60 units. 60 units. Yeah. Cause they have a budget of about two and a half billion dollars a year to work with. So what would you think for our budget of, um, what are we about 1.35? What do you think that we could afford to operate here and set up here in, in town? I mean, that that's that's what I was, since she's the expert in it, like how many units would we be able to get out of it? Because a lot of these uh, communities that you're talking about, their, their city budgets are in the billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Ours is one, 135 million. How many would you suggest that we could be able to set up at that point? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I'm definitely not an expert on, on your budget, but one thing I, I would, you know, offer and share is that we've, we've heard is that it's way more expensive to underserve than it is to create an option that people will accept that there's, you know, so much money goes towards uh, cleaning up encampments and, and towards emergency responses through EMS calls, I mean, and police calls. So that's something to also bear in mind as you're, as you're holding that those com cost comparisons together. Okay, thank you. Other uh, Councillor Martinez or take. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I would suggest that we um, uh, we would put together like the infrastructure and the initial setup, and whoever that housing agency uh, would be, they would write the grants for the sustainability piece moving forward. That's how I could see this project flying. Um. Elizabeth, I'm curious. So, you know, I, we do have the rescue mission here, which is um, emergency shelter for people. But one of the biggest, I think, gaps and needs is that they don't take um, folks with pets. Can you talk a little bit if if pallet shelters are pet acceptable or approved, I guess? Yes, they are pet friendly. That's one of the major things that um, uh, has been an ins inspiration behind our design is that it really allows for the whole family, you know, pets included to be accommodated. And so a lot of the majority of our villages have little pet runs that are put that are um, included in the project um, that allows for you know dogs to to run and then also they can stay with them in their individual unit. And have you talked at all to the rescue mission or Posada, which are two local housing agencies nonprofits we have here in Pueblo? I have spoken um, with the rescue mission with Ms. Rapier, and um, we've had a great conversation. And she's looking at um, our, one of our community structures right now um, for some of her needs. But from what I've heard, is that uh, they're kind of at capacity. Um, so, uh, in terms of you know connections to other service providers, we have we work with a lot of national um, organizations like Volunteers of America, um, and as well as service providers that are you know opening up new chapters, and we've you know tag team with them. Urban Alchemy is is such um, an example, and they are you know top notch. And um, if they, I would welcome that you guys have a conversation with them if you're interested in bringing in. Um, another type of service provider to add to your landscape of service needs. Yeah, I think let's continue to have this conversation because it seems like a really great innovative approach and I appreciate the data um, that supports that it works, that it's effective. So let's continue having this conversation. Um, 
other questions for Ms. Rudd before I let her go? Well, great. Thanks, Elizabeth. I guess we'll be in touch soon. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Okay, so next on our agenda, we have um, our friends from po the police department. So can I have Mr. Quintana and Mr. Allered to the podium, please, to discuss police officer retention. I've also never seen so many officers before in my life in one room. I feel very safe right now. So thanks, men and women. I just and just for clarification of the record, this is local union union local 537. All right, thank you. So first, I want to thank council for allowing us the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Jimmy Quintana and I'm the president of the IBPO local 537 police union. I represent 160 of the men and women who work to keep citizens and businesses of Pueblo safe day in and day out. Along with me is Chris Ellered, our IBPO secretary who designed, implemented the survey, survey, as well as put together this PowerPoint. So we're gonna start off with this right here, is why the survey was done. Members have been frustrated for years with the reduction in personnel and increase in calls for service. This includes a reduction in personnel, reduction in recruiting, increased calls for service, community projects, and just administrative responsibilities they have day in and day out. So again, over the past few years, it's alarming how many trained officers we have leaving for other agencies, which historically hasn't happened to this extent. With this happening, uh, we approached the city and asked permission to conduct this survey so we could see why officers are leaving and what, see if we can anything could be done to lessen or even stop this from happening. So the survey method was based on members' requests and suggestions. The survey was put together and sent out via email. Uh, it was determined the survey would be sent to all members to include command staff. So the way our, our union is designed, officers don't, don't become union members until after their first year of probation is over with. And then once any becomes a captain or higher, they are no longer union members. But I, we felt that when we put the survey out, that it would be good to send it out to everybody. So next one. What we did is we started to look at how many calls for service we've handled over the past 10 years. And then what you can see on this bar graph is that since 2000, since prior to 2012, our calls for service have steadily increased to around the 140,000 calls for service a year range. Next one. Um, as you can see, our calls for service have increased while some of the other cities that we compared to their calls have decreased. Uh, you see Pueblo, we're the first bar graph there. Uh, it's steadily increased where again, you see other cities, larger cities, Lakewood, Thornton, most of their calls have decreased. <clears throat> so we started to look at, uh, this side compares the calls for service that other agencies compared to. You will see the area on the far right of this slide here. Um, you will see that it's, that is the number of patrol officers we've done, we have, and the 1557 is the average calls for service that each one of our patrol officers handle. And if you look at Arvada, they are 394 less per officer. Fort Collins is 734 less per officer. Uh, Lakewood, and the only one that's comparable to us is Thornton. And now some of these calls for service from other agencies, their numbers are also skewed just because most of them include their animal control in their calls for service, which is the police department down here in the city of Pueblo. We do not cover that. So this right here is a breakdown of the survey. It was sent out to 193 respondents. We had a total of 80 uh, responses received, which is about a 41.4% response rate. And it breaks down to officers, corporals, sergeants, command staff, or other. The results were tallied. And part of the thing where we were asked the people taking the survey is give us three reasons why you would consider leaving the public police department. And uh, the top uh, one is higher salary, which is 63.5%, poor morale, which is 39.7%, uh, and then administration, administrative issues, 35%. So then another thing we asked is how long do you see yourself working for the public police department? And respondents, uh, we broke this down into increments year by year year one to two, two to three, and so on and so forth. And most of, at the time of the survey, we had 41 officers. We were down 41 vacant positions. 
So just looking at the pie chart and based on the survey, 58% of the respondents were looking to leave within four years. And so putting that together, that would mean that by if we don't work on recruitment and bringing people in and retention, that it's very possible that our agency could be down 85 positions by 2027. So we asked them what would keep them from leaving the department? 67.7% said higher pay, 32.3% said better leadership, and 27.7% said to feel more supported by command staff. So we decided to look, with so much focus on pay, we looked at the salaries of the comparable cities. What you will see is that in, uh, on the starting end, we are on average of 17.6% less than all the other comparable cities that we uh, use. And then we are on the top end, we're 15.5% less than again, the comparable cities. Looking at the starting salaries, uh, what would attract anyone applying to Pueblo over these other cities? And again, the entry patrol level, that's what they start off at. And so if you had all these departments at a round table and you had a new person wanting to be a police officer, he's gonna look there, what's gonna bring him to the city of Pueblo? And on the top end, what would keep trained officers here in the city of Pueblo over these other cities? And that's on the other side of it. Well, our pay scale breakdown, Pueblo PD officers have 10 yearly steps to reach top patrol officer pay, and then six yearly steps for corporal. Pueblo PD has corporals, we're the top 55 most senior officers. Pueblo PD officers, corporals reach top pay on average of 14 to 21 years to get to that position. All our other comparable cities have yearly steps and all max out in between four to six years. So at the end of the survey, we uh, asked respondents, were asked to give any additional comments. And so out of the total 51 respondents provided comments, here's a few of the examples that we uh, put in here. This is a 26 plus year officer. I hope that a quartermaster system becomes reality. I hope higher pay and lower insurance costs also become a reality. As far as fixing the problems with the public police department, I truly believe we as a department and as a society in general have fallen into a victim mindset and I've focused solely on the negativity in life. Negativity brings, breeds negativity, and I believe the only way to stop the bailout from this profession and this de uh, department is for everyone to remember why we began this profession, realize what, is, what this profession has done for us and our families, realizing we are making a difference and a majority of the public supports us and stop the victim mindset from the bottom of the ranks to the top. Next slide. This is a member with six to 10 years of service. The main issues I see with morale issues include difference in work ethic and resilience with newer generations. We have to make the job more tempting and promise for newer and younger officers compared to older officers who I feel have more resilience. There will always be issues with leadership, supervisors, politics, and the community. You cannot change this quickly and requires consistent effort and little changes in the right direction. Higher ups have to listen to those under them and not hold the opinions or concerns against them in any manner. An open discussion would truly be open with no emotion involved and no judgment. The only short-term solution to retention and hiring new officers is to throw money at the problem. This is the only thing that can be changed quickly and make an impact, but this will only net a short-term solution if the above long-term issues are not consistently, constantly and consistently dealt with in a positive manner. Short-term numerous things can be done to make demanding and heavily critique job more attractive. This includes better pay, cheaper insurance, providing more gear, training, and opportunities. And this last one, this is a member with zero to five years of service. I always hear how great an opportunity working in Pueblo is, but what is, but what is the end payoff? Yes, we can do search warrants and high priority calls, but there's no real payoff outside of leaving for another agency. The Pueblo Police Department does an excellent job at creating top tier officers, but does nothing to give them a reason to stay. The only thing keeping me here is that I am having fun with high octane work, but when I no longer want to do this kind of work, I have no reason to stay. I can't sustain this kind of work into my 50s so I can have a decent retirement. I personally have considered leaving multiple times, but it appears come, uh, always comes uh, back to, I'm still enjoying the work. If the department is serious about retaining officer, they need to have a reason for us to stay other than you won't find another experience like this anywhere else. So right there. So in meeting with members of council and the mayor, our hopes were to come together to fix the issues plaguing the Pueblo Police Department. At one point I was asked what could be done to fix these issues. I said a 10% increase in pay and a quartermaster system would help both in recruiting and retention. 
We are the only agency our size where our officers must purchase their own equipment and uniforms. As for our pay, we have fought negotiations with the city for equal pay with our comparable cities. We are always told because housing in this town is less than other cities, this is why the city uses the 85% hope for reduction in pay. We are not scheduled to enter negotiations with the city until 2024, which would put any new agreements not in effect until January of 2025. That is one and a half years of not knowing if we can retain and recruit officers. These officers behind me and the ones working the streets do not deal with lesser crimes than uh, our comparable cities. Our criminals don't commit 15% less crime than other cities, but our officers are paid 15% less. Our officers have been shot at at least six times in the past several months for doing nothing other than their job. Excuse me. We deal with the worst the city has to offer on a daily basis. We have an uptick in all violent crimes as compared to the rest of the state. Between the purse snatchings, armed robberies, and shootings, we also deal with homelessness issues. Now I know this job is, uh, is all we, now I know this is the job we have all signed up for when we became public police officers. The problem is, is when you pay us less for doing the same or more, this causes the morale to get worse and it causes people to look elsewhere where they feel more appreciated. Right now, officers have the ability to go anywhere in the U.S. to chase pay. If we continue losing more officers than we can hire, I do not know what the future holds for this town. The Chili Fest, the State Fair, and other events, we have only, uh, we have only because people attend them. My fear is if we continue losing officers, the crime will continue to rise and the quality of life will get worse in this town. If we do not keep officers on the streets working, I do not know if people will still come here due to the dangers this fa city faces day in and day out. I've lived here in this town my whole life. This is a proud town with a lot of history of hardworking citizens. Do you think we would have this history if the steel mill paid all of their workers in the past less because it's the city of Pueblo? It makes me mad, and it should also make you, the leaders of this town, mad to be looked at as second class to all their towns in this state. It's time for a change. It can happen as long as we, the IBPO 537, the police department, the mayor, and you, the city council, all work together to fix these issues. Last line. <clears throat> so in closing, the International Brotherhood of Police Officers, Local 537, its executive board, and the members behind me all want to thank you for your time and continued support. Are there any questions? Yeah, thanks so much for that, Mr. Quintana. Um, and Mr. Allered, um, I, your presence definitely is felt today. So I appreciate everyone for uh, showing up. Um, I guess questions or comments from council? Councilor Winner. Hi, thanks for coming. Thanks for that presentation. You know, um, my beef with the whole thing has always been the time it takes to hire a police officer. So you're looking at six to seven months to even hire someone. And it seems to me you're just getting local people. By that time, I mean, it, you know, if you apply for a job and you don't hear for six months, then you're just having local people. You don't have anybody recruiting in because they're already hired somewhere else. And, and I agree. And I have talked to council and other people and the way our civil service is designed. Right. Um, we've had officers, we have a recruiting officer that goes to all these different events. And there was actually one event where the state of Colorado was actually doing on-scene hiring. They're doing background checks and streamlining the process. We've heard of officers applying at different agencies. And by the time City of Public comes around saying, hey, we're here to offer you a job. Oh, four months ago, I already exactly. got a job here. You know, so, if, you're, if you're looking for a job, you need money and you've yes. got a supportive family, you need insurance, et cetera. So by the time we're calling them, uh, somebody's already taking their first one week vacation that they've already earned after six or seven months. So I agree. Um, I think it's I think that is your biggest problem. Um, everybody would would leave a job for money. So if number two is your leadership, that's an issue. Um, how much average do uh, the police officers make in overtime? That I don't have the figure. I know our overtime budget is out there. Um, we still hold officers forced overtime. There's always overtime available. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I don't have those figures offhand right now, but I can get them to you if uh, you would like. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do about civil service? I mean, does that take a charter amendment? I mean, what what does that take? Can we stop funding them? 
<laughs> That's about uh, my pay grade. <laughs> me too. Me too. I just uh, threw that out there as a, a, a question because, I, I mean, ultimately we probably could, but um, stop funding. I mean, but do, do you have any 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 comments on that? As far I, as I what didn't, didn't what, what what can we do about the civil service commission? As far as how long it's taking? So right, civil service is by charter, and so then uh, it has to be. Uh, Competitive examination based upon merit and fitness. Those are your charter standards. And we have adopted a number of ordinances implementing that. So you, I don't know what direction you want to go as far as that. But ultimately, uh, you're going to have to amend the charter because you're going to have to get out of uh, merit selection based upon competitive examination. So, or tweak the ordinances. But you know, there's not much you're going to be able to do to that. There's not Most much you can. jurisdictions. What about tweaking like or, Denver or they, they all have similar hiring processes. So there's you know it's not like so maybe these smaller jurisdictions or sheriff's office have uh, more flexibility. But that's where you're at as far as civil service. Mm -hmm. So I think there'd be plenty of uh, officers that would rather that would prefer a smaller town. To live in. I mean, I do. I prefer to live here rather than Denver. I mean, I lived there in the 80s and it was a mess. So it's even worse now. So uh, kind of on that, the officer that's doing recruiting, he is talking to some other people. And there was one example he just used recently where an officer said he looked at our starting pay and because we are down the way we are, he chose not at this time. He said in the future, if the pay would ever go up, then he would consider because he does like small town living. But unfortunately, arts are starting pay where officers are first trying to establish themselves the the amount that it's down so low they're they're like i'm going to go here and make more money over my career plus being able to get to your top level pay in a lot shorter time that has a lot to do with it all didn't you already didn't you already fix that we've tried for years and it's it was it just never happened why not negotiations with the city there's always other things there that kind of came into play Okay, so as far as tweaking ordinances, Bob, is uh, what did you mean by that as far as getting um, people hired more quickly? Well, you're not going to get out of the competitive examination. And civil service has met for over a year and a half trying to figure out tweaks to speed it up. And so uh, I don't think there's much there you're going to get out of it. Uh, what specific tweaks you could make? I don't know, because... I think they're streamlined as much as they can, consistent with the ordinances. And the, so, what about a charter? Well, I, how do you get out of that? Well, you'd have a have to have to you'd have to address the charter requirement that selection be based solely on merit and fitness, based upon competitive exam. I mean, you're you're talking about unraveling uh, a civil service system which I think has given a surety to many people that selection is going to be based on merit and fitness as opposed to uh, you know, political spoil concept or favoritism. Okay. Councilman Winter, the one thing I do wanna add is that we have put together a committee for dealing with civil service issues and meeting as a committee when we did, we were able to streamline some processes but unfortunately, there was there's the overall process of it. I don't know if there's any quick way of doing this other than asking civil service. Councilor Maestri. Okay, let's open the conversation. Um, what is it of everything that you presented here today wasn't presented in negotiations or was it? So the last time we went into negotiations was in 2019. We signed a multi-year contract. The mayor approached us during COVID and said, you know, let's see if we can put the hold on the contract. We did. We came back. We negotiated just like in not a full-blown negotiation, but we, so basically we're all, we have our contract out. We don't go back to negotiations till 2024. So that's a, it was a, we're basically in a five-year contract. And so at the time, you know, we, we got pay raises, we got vacation and whatnot. It just over the past few years, what we've noticed is because it's been such an open market, it's a competitive market for police, 
when I tested, I was one of 800 people that tested for 23 jobs. Mm -hmm. Now we have 41 jobs and we barely get maybe 100 people taking these tests. And so we started looking at it and why is that? And I, I said, are they going to these other towns? We're not any different than any other police across the country. But the one thing that we are looking at now is, is starting pay. We've started losing these officers, trained officers. It takes up to a year to train these officers. And when we start losing those trained officers, you got to figure it takes, once they leave, we start the application process. So you're looking at a year and a half before there's even somebody to even attempt to take their place. And we're losing a lot of officers to these other agencies because they're able to go up there and follow, take their family up there, make more money and be at these top pay. Because right now it's an open market. One of my supervisors made the joke, I could put 11 applications out and get 13 job offers right now because it is such an open market for police. And I think that's another thing we have to be, figure out a way that we, the city of Pueblo can be competitive with these other agencies up North. Okay, and so, and I ask you these questions so the public understands, because yes. this will obviously become a public issue when we're going outside of the collective bargaining negotiations and trying to do, is that, I'm asking you, is that what you were coming to council for, is you're asking us to help you make changes to the, to the contract, or you're just letting us know, or? I'm just letting you know basically what's happening. And if, again, we're a year and a half out until anything negotiations are taking place. And I'm afraid if we don't work together on something and fix these issues, mm -hmm. it's going to get worse before it gets better. Oh yeah. It's, it's already worse before. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate to see how much worse it's going to get. So do I, you know, and so, you know, my heart goes out to you guys. I know you guys, I see you guys out there all the time working hard not even being able to do your job anymore, which you did sign up for when you signed on and were sworn in many years ago. And as we, our community, I mean, we hear it all the time from constituents, news all over that, you know, the crime has gone, gotten out of control here. And so you guys are kind of in, stuck in the middle and it's, you know, um, it's tough. It's it tough. is. It's very, very tough. And so um, I, I don't know how we're going to do this because once we set precedents of jumping outside of negotiations, then that's every union in town is going to want to do that, right? You know, so we have to make it, we have to be uh, real, um, figure out how we're going to get this done um, and offer something better for our blue because right now you're, you guys are, you know, your only protection of all you, you know, you're all we've got. And we've got to do something. So thank you for coming. Thank you. It's it's very it takes a lot of courage too to get up here and talk about things when you know how it runs. Yes. You know how the system runs. And I would have liked to see that during negotiations in your last time that you don't be afraid to come to the table with negotiations and just tell us what you need, what what's what needs to go on. Um, you know, people don't need to be afraid of their jobs because are a lot losing their jobs because they want to talk about the work environment and, and everything else that goes bad. With Unfortunately, them. four years ago when we were in negotiations, we didn't have this bad problem. It just, mm -hmm. it's, it's growing now. So, but thank you. I had a couple of, one, one a comment, one a question, and that has to do with your health insurance. You mentioned that health insurance was uh, an issue and I'm, I'm not sure you just used the word insurance, but I'm, I'm curious, was it the health insurance that you're concerned about? Just the cost of our health insurance. And the reason I bring that up is that, you know, prior to probably 2016, those premiums kept going up and we converted the city of Pueblo to a self-insurance yes. plan. And, uh, and I'm looking at Laura right now because it's been a while since we've had someone present it's been my understanding that our premiums have, have actually declined and have kind of leveled off and have stayed pretty steady for the last five years. And uh, if that isn't the case, I think we need to revisit, uh, you know, the, the health insurance issue because it, it took a nosedive when we went to self-insurance. And uh, I, it, at least that little piece, maybe we can compare with other cities. I've, I've got to believe that we are probably at the low end. But I, I don't know the answer, so I think we're gonna we'll we'll talk to our uh, our risk manager 
Council Floors, we can do a couple of things. We yep. can either ask for a work session um, on um, an update on the self-insurance plan. Uh, the HR director is in attendance this evening. I'm not sure she, that um, she knows those answers, but she's going to well, she's she's going to shake her head yes or a work session update whichever you'd like if you'd like her to come down to the to the, the podium right now I'd, I'd like a, a comprehensive report and okay. uh, give her time to put put it together so it goes over a number of years we'll schedule that work session for the update right. and send it out to you electronically as well because it would be it would be nice to know okay that if, I really believe that if you compare our health insurance rates now to anybody along the front range we're probably at at the low level. I'm hoping that's what it should. I haven't looked at it in about a year and a half, but uh, uh, the other question, uh, my question has to do with, uh, what, what are you seeing other police departments or other communities doing as far as incentive, incentivizing people to come to Pueblo? Uh, I, I know there's, I, I, I read lots of different ideas. People are trying to be creative, uh, helping people with, uh, maybe a down payment on a house, uh, that kind of stuff. What other things are you seeing as, as an incentive? Well, we're seeing it from a lot of agencies. There, Everybody's doing sign-on bonuses now. Again, like the one statement was made, let's throw money at the problem. You know, so the talk has been bonus money, but bonus is just for right then and there, because come next year, we're going to have the same issues again if we don't fix the overall problem. <clears throat> And I think a lot of people are starting to look at retirement and later on in life, and this is a career and it shouldn't be, I'm just going to shop around. And unfortunately with bonus pays, a lot of places say five years and is all you need to stay here. So are people going to this agency for five years? And then in five years, I'm going to look for some other agency to make an additional $20,000 in bonus pay and go here for five years or, you know, and it, it has to be, if you're going to incentivize something, it has to be equal for everybody. If you, offer a down payment for a house. It has to be somebody that wants to come in to Pueblo and buy a house in the city of Pueblo. If I have somebody that is applying, they live in Pueblo West, they're still a resident of Pueblo, but they have their house out there. They're not gonna take advantage of it because they're not gonna uproot their whole family just to move into the city of Pueblo to take advantage of say, some extra money. And so you have that issue to where it's not equal for everybody. If you wanna incentivize something, it has to be equal for everybody. And not just new recruits, but the officers, the ones that are continued working, the ones that work the streets, that handle the calls for service. Because again, they also want to feel appreciated. If you're just appreciating the new ones coming in, yes, thank you, because we do need more help out there. But we also need to show the officers that have been working, that have worked 10, 15, 20 plus years, hey, we appreciate you also. Here's something for you also. The, uh, the the occupation that you're in, uh, my, my son is a, an associate warden at uh, Colorado Department of Corrections, and he is in control of one prison, and they're down 70 people, and it's it's really scary. In fact, they've the state has reduced the age you can work at a prison to 18, which to me is also very scary. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's a tough job. Period. And uh, the recruitment just goes along with that. Uh, so, uh, you know, I certainly appreciate the information. I think we, we need to continue this discussion uh, because I think we hear you loud and clear, uh, but we need to get, uh, you know, some additional data and also talk about, uh, you know, where we go from here. And I think just making it attractive to come to Pueblo. I think that would help with recruitment and retention. What can we do? to make us just as attractive as these other towns. I understand, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Tencio. Yeah, I've been calling for parity for our police department, our city department, and even our uh, city employees. Uh, parity in terms of being paid the same, comparable to other cities our size. And th there isn't any reason why we shouldn't do that. The excuse that we pay 85% that doesn't hold water anymore because uh, the cost of living here isn't 85% less than it is other places. Uh, uh, we, the, the money that we spend here goes to uh, us. And, and I don't see anything wrong with our police department, our general services employees and our fire department being paid uh, some of the top wages in town. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. You deserve it, you, uh, you should have it. 
and I am certainly in favor of, of, of a 10%, uh, even if we do go outside of the uh, negotiations, a 10% increase. That only takes us to uh, about 64,000 for entry level. That's uh, on par with Aurora, Colorado Springs, Denver, and Lakewood's a little higher, but uh, still uh, that puts us in you know, on par with those cities and we should do it. Also a quartermaster system, we should have that. And uh, uh, we should also do some, we have really got to do something with uh, the pay scale, uh, reaching that top level in, in what? 14 or 21 years. 14 or 21 years is, I mean, that's ridiculous. It, who wants to stay in a job where he's never going to uh, reach the top Me. level? Nobody wants to be. <laughs> nobody. Nobody wants to be at the bottom level uh, for years and years and years and years. Everybody wants to move up. Uh, uh, you want to become a, a sergeant. You want to become a corporal. You want to become a captain. Everybody wants to do that, and they want. We got to give them the opportunity to get there. So I, I am definitely in favor of uh, getting that entry level up to. 10% uh, higher than what it is today. Also, um, does this mean a 10% across the board increase for everybody? Well, for the bargaining unit, uh, unfortunately, I don't bargain for captains, deputy chiefs, chiefs. But again, I just, it's for, for our, the IBPO 537 and yeah. any new people yeah. coming in because they're eventually going to be union members. Yeah. I, I'm in favor of it because uh, we have more calls than any other city our size. You do more work and you get paid less. That's that's not right. It's ridiculous, and you should be paid uh, on par on par with everybody else. Thanks. That's simple. Councilor Graham. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for um, the presentation. Um, I know that you've also been asked to provide some amounts on what that would look like for the quartermaster system. I think, I think we're sitting right about $400,000. Is that correct? And do you have an average on what a 10% increase would be for a year? So we looked at uh, the cost for where the officers currently are. And like, again, like I said, again, this is sergeants, corporals, and patrol officers. Um, a six month cost would be about $735,000 for a full year uh, would be one, uh, 1,469,000. Thanks. Um, our, our, one of our number one jobs up here is public safety, and that's, you know, dealing with the police and dealing with the fire. Um, tonight, we're here to talk about police and the police union. The officers are down 50 people. The fire is 100 percent staff. So I just want to make that clear that we're here to talk about fire to, or police tonight, not about fire and not about Paige. I'm not sure how many um, positions Paige is down, but if we're down 50 people, too. Paige needs to come and talk to the council and we need to get you guys some help because we need to staff um, all of our departments as fully staffed as we can be and be comparative, like Councilor Atencio said. And so how do you make public more attractable? Well, you have to pay better, number one. And how do you retain officers? We have to give um, the officers that we already have a better quality of life um, than what, they're ha when they, what they have or they're gonna leave, which we're seeing. Um, we've seen several officers already leave. I know there's a threat of more officers to leave. The council doesn't act um, quick and swift. And this is definitely um, a time for def des desperate measures. And so I know it is not normal to go out of um, negotiating terms, but like Councilor Atencio said, I think that it's something that we need to um, act on now. And so I'm giving direction to staff um, to propo propose an ordinance for a 10% increase um, across the board to corporals, um, sergeants, everybody, because they're all doing the same work that everybody in the union's doing. Um, and I want to see that on our May 8th agenda alongside an ordinance uh, for a quartermaster system to be um, implemented and what that looks like. I know that the staff has probably been preparing for this because we've been knowing what the union's going to come and ask. Um, so I don't think that we should have to drag this out any further than it's already been. So real quickly, we can't act unilaterally. We're going to have to have an agreement. And how do we get uh, there? The, so what you would be proposing is either an amendment to the contract, and that have to be drafted, reviewed, and approved by them, and then submitted. There's no right to unilaterally come in, even if generally they don't object. To right. That. You don't have any unilateral right to say that this is what's that going to we want to give you more money? Yeah. Okay. Usually, though, it's not hard to negotiate. Sure. 
Uh, but um, so that sort of direction, um, you know, it'd have to be drafted as an amendment to the contract and presented. And, and the other thing is, um, I don't know, do you want staff review of any of these numbers before you proceed? And I also, think, do you I, I want, so. we should have specific yeah. numbers. That's 3.8 yeah. million was the 10%. Yeah. Yeah, we we just can't do it willy nilly. We have to know exactly what it. Uh, I mean, do yeah. you want another work session to let you know what you're actually walking into? Because this concept of raising the, the bar to ten percent will then be, a, you know, how do you distinguish it that from all the other employee groups? Because eighty five percent, I understand it's frustrating, but that's that's been recognized in three arbitration decisions. And there's a basis for that. Uh, if you want to change that policy, do you not? Do you want to be informed of what the other issues are going to be addressed with that? Do you want alternatives suggested from the administration? Alternatives in the form of ARPA paid for bonus pay to get them through the year, wherein the next time we go into negotiations, then these issues could actually be negotiated. Uh, as far as what you want the con the the actual wage rate to look like, I, mean, I wouldn't want to. Go I, I think it's a little snap. Yeah. I, I I think if we get uh, specific numbers as to what it would cost to the ten percent, uh, and the quartermaster and get specific costs on those, we could we, we make a decision. We have the quartermaster already. That's that's already done. Well, the thing you would want to negotiate on the quartermaster is changes to the current contract to implement it changes to the current contract because right now we give them a uniform pay so you'd want to address what is that going to look like uh, will they continue with some sort of annual pay uh, will the city have the right to control how the quartermaster systems operated including you know design selection generally we have that right but these are things you don't You'd want to work through as far as an agreement with the police union. I know they're in a that? rush, but I'd recommend that. Yeah. And always, always, we'd always be open to anything, just like when the city approached us about amending the contract back in 2020 when the COVID hit. It would be no different than that, and we would always be open. What's and so, just for that? clarification, too, I mean, uh, you can voluntarily amend the contract whether you're in. Uh, uh, the charter requirements for negotiations or you have a current agreed contract. So there's no limitation on that. But I think you got to work through the issues as to what the uh, the contract amendment's going to look like. Mm -hmm. And I think staff needs a little bit more direction. Uh, you know, I don't, do you want to hear from staff on some of these issues? Because you concept of just pulling it up to 10%, going from 85%, which has been the standard and a reasonable reason for it for the last two decades, and just jump to 95%. Because I think that that has ramifications beyond the police union. So I just want to make sure council's aware of what those potential ramifications are. Uh, and we certainly have no problem We've we've sat down with the police and negotiated off off cycle many times. Just last year, we did it to increase them. We've done it with Page and Fire too. And so I'll, I'll take your direction, but I think that uh, you might want to you might want to hear from staff. Well, that that sounds session. Maybe we could get that sounds right. That's good. Yeah. So, well, I want to. So, Councilor Graham, did your question get answered? How long is that going to take, Bob? Well, uh, I, I, well, my schedule is kind of full. Uh, I have no problem. Uh, we could set a meeting up, but I'd want to. The police union, the police department's going to have to come in on the quartermaster and see what we want to do as far as the contract. Just changing the amounts to add ten percent is not that problem. But I, you know, I, I would think you'd want to hear from from staff on some of the issues including costs. So uh, the next thing I think reasonable would be to have a work session where staff could present some of those issues. Because I don't, you don't have time tonight. And I know, I know that, that there are. But the, the one thing I do want to make sure is you understand uh, that 
increasing the wage rate 10%, and now we're going to go from an 85%, which we've historically been trying to get to, to 95, and then that's going to carry on in every contract. That's that's a big cost item, and you're going to have the other unions wanting a similar treatment as far as comparability. They have a much better argument regarding staffing that they can bring in. Uh, but to me, that think I think that that would the best approach for that would be the alternative of a bonus pay funded by ARPA, and you know we'd look through the ARPA factors. But based upon the presentation tonight, it seems like that would might fit better. And then you have a source of funding that you're not tying up every year's budget for, yeah. and then it would leave you room to come back and revisit the topic uh, next year but you'd have that immediate release for this year. But I'll take your direction. Councilor Flores. Uh, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you, you came tonight to give us kind of uh, an overall picture, uh, which was very compelling about what is happening. But I think you probably were wanting the next step in meeting with um, you know, our representative that you deal with every year. Uh, so that we can clearly understand what it is you're asking. And obviously, it's all revolving around, uh, you know, your pay, which is significant. But I mean, there's other things. And so, but what we have here is a legal contract that uh, everybody's agreed to. Yes. And you're asking us now, can we undo that and, 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 and increase your pay when in fact, I think you haven't had a chance to probably nail down what it is you want. And, and I think you need that time to negotiate so, uh, with our staff. Let me clarify something. Our intent behind this was never to break contract. We wanted to figure out what was the problem. So when everybody started telling us we need more money, we're leaving because of other stuff, we started doing the figures and that's what showed how much significantly less that we are. And also when, uh, uh, Chris Ellerid called these other agencies. We also have their figures for next year. We already know the city of Aurora is going to be giving their officers come next year an additional nine point something percent increase. So again, if we don't, we as a city and everybody come together, it's going to continue getting worse because these other towns that are doing this, they are recognizing, okay, and they're giving their officers additional money. So if we don't do something now, it's just, we're just going to be that much farther behind. And we agree, everybody in the city should be the 85 percentile. We've been all arguing it for years, us fire general service, but it's whatever happened, happened, and that's what's in place now. And I think this is a time for the city of Pueblo to change, to show all employees of the city of Pueblo that this is a very good place to work, this is a good place to live, and you can make a decent uh, wage while working and living here. And that was a whole intent behind it. It was never an intent to break contract. So I just want to make that 100% clear. And so it was just, we need to figure out a way to stop this. Unfortunately for us, police department, pay is the main thing. So, well, you know, one of the things that's one of our responsibilities, aside from, you know, safety, which is our number one priority, is also uh, staying within our budget. All of us passed a budget. And, uh, you know, we'll, it'll be coming up again here in October. So it's kind of an annual cycle. But, you know, there, there, I, I still need questions answered on your insurance because I think I want to know that. I want to know, uh, you know, what it is we, we have within the budget that we could provide. And then we have to have a deeper discussion on the consumer price index. And that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, you know, and that's the 85% rule he's talking about is that it's much more expensive. As one example, the median price of a house in Denver right now is 695, in Springs it's 430, and here in Pueblo it's 330 uh, for the same typical house. So it, I, I know that there is uh, a, 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 at least a discussion about the consumer price index, but I'm, you know, I, I don't think we jump into this without getting all this information. Uh, and I think your argument would probably be more compelling too. And I think at some point, uh, uh, I think the, the current, we have to have a discussion with the staff too, uh, because there's a lot of people involved here, HR, our, our interim attorney, uh, our chief of staff, our mayor, all of that. 
So I, th I think you've made your point about what, what it is. I think we're all sympathetic to that, but we're going to need uh, to be able to get our arms around all the information that we, what we understand is going to work for us as far as recruitment and also uh, looking at the pay increase. Yes, sir. Councilor Warner. Thank you. Um, again, like I said, anybody's going to answer that higher pay is a consideration in any, I mean, in any job that you have. So if leadership's an issue, I, I think that needs to be spoke about a little bit more. I mean, you, you will give up a higher paying job just because the leadership is horrible and you can't deal with it to a lower paying job as well. Happiness is, is, has a lot to do with staying with the job or not staying with the job. And also I've asked um, uh, Laura to bring in the uh, state demographer to give us a, a, a good comprehensive um, educational session about um, the situation of employment in this country because uh, there are no employees out there. So you're probably gonna have people shifting all over the place all the time until the year 2040. I mean, we have been preparing for this, this loss in employees for years and years. That's why we've developed um, self-checkout and all of that. People were saying, oh, they just don't wanna pay people. And that's why they wanna get rid of cashiers. And that wasn't. The reason is because we don't have people. Baby boomers are retiring. And that next generation and the next after that, you're, we're gonna have less and less people until 2040. So um, unless you figure out how to hire people more quickly <laughs> and um, maybe have better leadership, I don't think you're gonna have retention. And uh, let me put something, I've been a police officer for 24 years and in my whole 24 years, there's always somebody that's not happy with leadership. That's any job you go into. So I just wanted to put that out. But in wasn't addition, that number two on your survey? Yes, it was. Right. And again, it's if you go down the years, there's always somebody that's not happy with leadership. Unfortunately, and we're in a paramilitary organization and we have rules that we have to follow. And there's some people that just, man, I really don't want to. And maybe that's why they're unhappy. It, you know, that's something we have to look at. There was no scientific study behind this. We just asked, and this is what they- Whenever you have a very cohesive team, you have happiness. Yes, I understand. And, and you know, and part of it is we do have to speed up the process. I think that would help us because if we can get them in the door before they get another job offer, that really would help. Again, so go several years back, there was a time when we had officers that had degrees and other stuff, but the city of Pueblo Police Department was paying good comparatively to the, all the other places. And so we had people leaving their professions and becoming a Pueblo Police Officer because one, there was job stability, they had good pay and good retirement. Unfortunately, I think that's, we've just fallen behind the wayside now. And so again, if we can make it attractive, we can, bring in from other people. We've had people that never had any ambition to become a police officer and they've been some of the best police officers we've ever had because they, something attracted them to the job and brought them here and kept them here. Yeah, I guess my point was that they're just, the, the people are just not there. And yeah. I think that state tomographer, um, when they come, I think everybody in, in town should watch that because it's very educational. Um, I guess that's, that's all I had. Okay, we have to move on. Councilor Tensio. I think it's critical that we get this done. You just said that other cities are going to be giving a 9% increase. That puts, if we give a 10, we're still going to be 9% behind everybody else. And I'm asking for parity. Uh, we won't be able to achieve that if that if they do that 9%. But let's have that uh, work session. Uh, staff could bring uh, the information that we need because I think we need the information. We just can't do it willy-nilly and just say, hey, 10%. That's all there is to it. Well, let's get the information. Let's have that work session and then uh, work from there because this has to get done. Ms. Solano. Um, yes, yeah, so staff is communicating electronically here. Uh, for the data with respect to the 10% increase in wage, that's easy to calculate in a week and come back. However, the you know, information on the insurance, we've got to reach out to, to Hub and capture some other information and Fine. do some research. So um, the suggestion is two weeks. Um, which makes it May the 8th, or would you like a, a, a week longer at, at May 15th? Be, and I don't know if you want them to meet with the, the union and Bob before they return or after. Would you just like data, or would you like them to have to have met? Can you work together? Yeah. Let's get them together. And... We will try to do either May 8th or the following Monday. Okay. The information to me is sweet. important here. I, I don't think we're uh, you're intending for us to do this in the next a month or two weeks. Uh, you, you want you want this to be uh, a discussion 
it's, it's going to be productive and that we're going to have the correct data. Sounds like, uh, Larry, do you, you think that we should try to get this done in the next two weeks? Two or three? I, I, don't, I don't think that's I don't possible. See. You're asking staff to do th something that I think is impossible. June 5th. The state democracy was scheduled for June the 5th. So she wanted to come directly and she wanted to come in person. And that's the first time that's fit on her calendar. I, I do understand the immediacy of this, as especially um, I think that you've made some really compelling arguments. And I think that the majority of council understands that that this is an immediate issue that we need to talk about. And so I'd like to propose um, if staff cannot do it, um, what I'm I guess that I'm hearing by, you know, by May 1, I think I would like to move forward to May 8th. Um, for the data and that conversation with Mr. Jagger and uh, the local, is with, is that possible? They're, they cannot do this by May 1. If that's just a week out without having a conversation with Hub, we'll work on that second week of a May 8th. Yeah, I mean, obviously on our end, sooner than later would be better for us, just so we can try to fix this before the next hiring cycle and just so we can kind of Get this going that's obviously on our end that's what we would think okay so then let's um continue this conversation then may 8th it sounds like staff's going to get us some more data in terms of the financial impacts and at that work session we will talk more about planning um both the quartermaster system and then give some type of direction to uh you know whatever that whatever the financial implications look like because then after that you need a first reading and a second reading, which is two weeks apart. Um, so that's why I think the immediacy part of sooner rather than later uh, is, is gonna be best. All right, so uh, May 8th, that work session. See you guys then. Thank you guys cool. very much. And thanks for everyone for being here. Okay. Last on our agenda, we're very behind now, um, is a uh, trash cleanup update. Well, they're already here. And then I saw Barbara too. Miss Barbara, are you presenting? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to give everyone a minute to leave the room. We're going to try this uh, trash cleanup. I think so. Or do you want to postpone it, Stephen? It's up to you guys. What I can you... whiz through it. It's... It didn't take too long. All right. Five minutes. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so... The um, item on the agenda that we're going to be talking about is the trash cleanup update. Before uh, us, we have Ms. Barbara and Mr. Meyer. So also, I think it fits right in line with the team up to cleanup event that we're planning too. So yes. let's talk yeah. about it. And Andrew's here to talk about that at the end. So we'll kind of whiz through this uh, slideshow. This is team up to clean up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our trash totals that we've come up to date. Uh, this is Barbara out picking up trash and all the sites. We kind of reported on this a few weeks ago. These are updated numbers as of last Tuesday, up to 36 and a half tons, 268 tires, 6,492 needles, and 404 shopping carts, which is a lot of shopping carts. These are the areas that we're kind of finding the trash out there. You can kind of look at that. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but this is kind of how the poundage works out through all the different sites. There's going to be a series of slides that's just going to show you what they're cleaning up, what they're seeing out there in the fields. And Barbara's uh, and her crew is doing a great job cleaning up. This is 26 and Dillon. A lot of these are down along the area behind Target and Goodwill and down to King Supers. A lot of these uh, slides are down or showing pictures of those areas uh, in order for us to get in front of the crew that's coming through there to do the fire mitigation, cutting down the, the trash trees that are in the area. 
Um, same area. This is the trash you see in. This is all hidden back in there in those trees. Shopping carts, plenty of them. Nice little huts and tents and makeshift outhouses. Buried in, they, they burrow into those uh, bank sides, <clears throat> make little forts and underground caves. We've got some decoration up in this camp. This is the buckets of needles that she's been picking up. They collect, throw them in a bucket, and take them over to a, a site that disposes them for her. They came across the last Friday um, one site that had like 1,800 needles, just one spot. This is the map. Um, that shows where we've been and where we're going. Um, I haven't gotten a site that I think Sarah, you mentioned to me one day, we'll get that. Um, but this is kind of just for you to kind of understand where all they've been and where they're going. And this is Andrew. This is for uh, the team up to cleanups, a uh, big cleanup on May 6th. So thank you, Council, for just taking a moment to uh, give us a chance to talk about the uh, Team Up to Clean event that's coming up. So Saturday, May 6th, State Fairgrounds from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Folks will have an opportunity to bring uh, household waste, yard waste, uh, tires, um, and, uh, and other items as well, large items. Uh, there's some details on this flyer. There's details on the city's webpage. There's details on city social media sites as well about this event. In addition to the team up to clean up, uh, into the team up to clean up uh, citywide drop off event on May 6th, citizens also have the ability to take items to the landfill from May 8th to May 20th. Uh, Waste Connections has a discount days program going on for approximately two weeks. So for about three weekends in a row in May, uh, citizens of Pueblo have a, a lot of opportunities to be able to do some spring cleaning. In addition to these things, we're also working on some pop-up cleanups. These are our smaller, very, uh, what I call hyper-focused neighborhood cleanups. We're still going to be doing those. Uh, we've got one that'll probably be coming up here about mid-May, and those will be ongoing through the summer months as well. So uh, I know we're short on time, but we're happy to take any questions you have also about uh, cleanup efforts going on right now. Yeah, thanks. That was speedy. Um, can we go back to the previous slide when you're talking about the future cleanups? So we can reference it. Great, thanks. What questions are there from Council? Councilor Tencio. Yeah, uh, we had that pallet presentation. How much can we alleviate this situation that you just showed us by having one of those pallet villages? In your opinion, what do you think? I, I don't know. You want to take a guess? I think that. Having an alternative place for people to stay is important, but it needs to be a place that people want to go. So nobody yeah. will use it if it's not available, but they also need to be in a place where people want to be. Um, yeah, I just, I just had a thought because we have all these camps down on sure. the river bottoms. And if we were to have a place, I'm just wondering. I think, I think there's a number of uh, opportunities that present themselves by having uh, available beds for emergency shelter space. Um, but I think there are also some other projects going on that may address some of that. Okay. Councillor Maestri. I got a call from one of my constituents. What is the deal with all of the rotomilling from the roads? I know they're they're putting them out on city property. And yeah, so that's a temporary storage place for now. And I think I know which constituents we're talking about. They've been very vocal about things in that in that uh, open lot. Yeah. And as promised last time, uh, when we had the green waste disposal there, those items would be removed. Uh, it's a temporary storage place right now. The place where we store our rotor milling uh, out at a uh, site called Chester is full. So this rotor mill stuff is, is material that we'll use to help uh, 
work on alleys and build it, uh, work in a road base and other other projects. So it's not there permanently, oh, but it's taken off of a Ridge that, Drive, which is just completed. How long will it be there? I would say within a month or two, we'll have it out. But it's it's going to be worked down at a, a little at a time. So we're taking it from there to project sites. Yeah, because that that yep. existing future park is always just a mess anyways. It's just got a ton of weeds, a ton of trash. Sure. And now we're putting the roto milling um, so my hope is also that I know there's a complaint about dust. This should be a dust palliative so that as vehicles and other things are driving back there, there shouldn't be as much kicked up. When the whole time they were talking to me about it is with those poor people on the west side that live right there by the 24th street. And you've got all the concrete and you've got all the big piles of spills from other projects. And then they came in here and actually they kind of got this all started here last year when they were talking about you know, people living in those areas and the trash in those areas. And, you know, it's just, as a city, we just need to be a better neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Flores. There's a, a spot right at the 29th Street and the railroad track. So last Friday, we cleaned that all up. Did you up if you haven't seen it yet, it looks completely different than it did on Friday about midday. It was, a, it was a big mess, but there were a number of calls and concerns that came in. So we set up traffic control, shut down the, shut down the outside lanes there, and it, it, the shopping carts are gone. The trash is picked up. Uh, the shelters that were built under the bridge are gone. It Maybe looks completely this, different. My next question has to do with the, the condition of the Fountain Creek. Uh, does anybody take testing? Do they test the Fountain Creek for... Water waste and, and E. coli and all of that. It just seems as though we could shut that down if 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 that area is being tested. Well, they test at the wastewater treatment plant above and below it, so they they know what's coming in, what's coming down Fountain Creek. Because I I think there's a there could be a way of shutting those camps down if in fact uh, there you know the people can get sick uh, by just even you know waiting in, in the in the Fountain Creek. Yeah. So but I'll I'll follow through on that with the health department. Thanks. We can well we can follow up with you from a stormwater perspective as well. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Councillor Martinez Ortega. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um and thank you all. Thank you, Barbara, so much for all the work that you've been doing leading leading those groups out there. Um, I think that we have um there was a cleanup on Abriendo, um, I think off I-25. Um, that was really successful. That looks great. Um, another uh, access to a commerce point would be um, Macaulay Avenue and I-25. That would be a, a good one if there's uh, if you're open to more places to clean stuff up. That just send me an email or let me know. We'll do. Thank you, and thank you all for. Uh, what you're doing. Any other questions? How many employees have you been able to hire for this? How many? How many She's got people? 10 part-time. 10. Then herself. How are, how in kind of in line with that question, how are we doing with that budget? Should, do we, are we concerned about it? <laughs> you know, I should have printed out, a, I should have got a hold of a printout of the budget. I don't know where we're at with it, but we're still pretty early on. Okay. I think they've got a couple months of part-time, you know, expenses on it and trailer and trucks and all that's been allocated. Great. Ms. Solano. I would just capture that information from Alex and just send it to you electronically. Oh, great. I, yeah, I, I guess I just want to make sure that we're still good. And I know that there was the separate budget for our team up to clean up events. Are we good on that budget? Correct. We're still good there. We had $300,000 initially set aside and that's funded both the previous cleanups this cleanup and other cleanup efforts as well. So we're still okay there. I can get you a number. Again, same story. We can pull electronically and get you an exact number of what's remaining there. Uh, and But we're good for there? Yes, we're good for this cleanup for sure. And the pop-up cleanups are coming out of that budget? They vary. So those costs that are incurred there are primarily um, labor, right? Labor and equipment. So we're not buying dumpsters or other things. We, we, we did charge one dumpster, I think, to a pop-up cleanup at a time. So it's, it's only three or $400 each. And for those pop-up cleanups, are they, do they have to be fall within the census tract? No, those are, those are not, those aren't tied to the same. Those are not, uh, no, different, different set of ARPA. Okay. The lost revenue. Correct. 
So if we have an idea for a pop-up cleanup, we can email you. Absolutely. Mr. Hayes, great. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you so much for that very speedy presentation, Mr. Meyer, Ms. Barbara, and Mr. Hayes. Um, it is 7.19 p.m. and I'm gonna conclude this work session. We're gonna have a 10 minute recess before our regular meeting begins.